This is a picture of my father taken out of a book called the Auschwitz Album, uh, which I found uh, some uh, 14 years ago. Uh, it's published uh, by Random House, I believe, or one of the publishing companies. This was taken, as I mentioned earlier in my, in my talk, uh, right after we got off the train in Auschwitz. The SS took pictures of these Hungarian transports arriving, and I just happened to look in this book, and I see my father standing there looking at me as he got off his train with his overcoat. It was May, it was warm, but he carried a coat just to make sure that he doesn't freeze in the winter, and a hat on with the glasses on the right there, on the right side of, 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 the, of the picture. And this is the picture from the same book, the Auschwitz album. My father already processed. His clothes are taken from him. He got his striped uniform on. His hair is being cut. And he is already uh, part of the uh, inmates of uh, Auschwitz. Um, it was just fortuitous that I stumbled across this book and saw these pictures. But they are priceless to me. This is my family. It was uh, taken, I would imagine, in the uh, late 30s, uh, 37, 38. Uh, my father, my mother, I'm the one who's sitting down, and my little brother, Peter, who must have been, what, I don't know, three, four years old at the most at that time, a very curious little guy, blonde, blue-eyed kid who, he and my mother, who never made it. I found this picture somewhere. I, 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 I'm not sure where I got it. One of, I think, my, again, my, it must have come from Budapest, from one of my aunts, uh, my father's aunts that gave me this picture. It was about 1955. I should, I'm jumping ahead of myself. My father was in Germany, of course, and I left him there in 1949. He was very sick. He, he couldn't come to America because he was still TB positive. This is the picture of my mother and her sisters. Uh, I, this picture came to me via Israel. Um, the uh, woman sitting down on the right, uh, Susan, or Zhuzhi as we call her, she's still alive. She's 95 years old. She's in a nursing home in, in Israel. Uh, she and her daughter, Judith, survived the camps, and her son survived the labor uh, battalions in Hungary. He was an officer in the Israeli army. He died in 1948 in a jeep accident. It was really tragedy. But I like to just mention the names of all these women. Uh, in, uh, chronologically, the one on the left is, is Golda or Aranka. She just died uh, about uh, five, eight years ago. Uh, she's buried in Israel. Uh, she was not in a camp. She survived in Budapest. Uh, the one next to it is Lily, the youngest, uh, from left to right. Uh, she is the one who lived in Tarasco. Her husband was Ijo, who really probably saved my life in Auschwitz. Of course, she with her two children did not. She, she was killed immediately. The kids were too young. The middle person standing up is my mother, Hinda or Heinal. The one next to it is Etta or Ethel. She is the wife of, uh, uh, her name was Schreiber, a uh, married name. She and my mother got married on the same day to two pharmacists. In those days, you couldn't get married until all the sisters were married. So you couldn't marry out of order. So since Etta was older than Heinal, my mother, they had a double wedding, and they married two pharmacists. She didn't survive the camps either. Zhuzhi is the one on the right sitting down. This was taken in her garden in Rimasumbat in Slovakia or Czechoslovakia. She's in uh, Israel now in a nursing home, 95 years old. Has many children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Uh, this is the diploma I received from the Ord School in Munich in 1949. They misspelled my name, Balashas, S-C-H, instead of S-A, Georg in German. And it says on uh, August 1949, I was born in August 30th, 1949, uh, 29 in Tachovo, and I fulfilled my, my, it's in English, so if I can read it here from far away, but anyway, I fulfilled my, 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 training with the grade of good, and it's dated 19th August uh, something, 1949, and signed by the deans and things with the, of the old school in Munich. And uh, this, this, uh, start all over again? The, this is, this is my, okay. And this, this is the, uh, the uh, here I started really my career in dentistry, because this is where I got my first certificate as a dental technician, dental mechanic they call it. And this led into uh, my job and eventually dental school and dentistry itself. You hear my Hungarian accent? 
I have one. It's mm -hmm. light. Shall I introduce myself as a doctor? I'll introduce you as doctor, oh, yeah, and you can... I can say what I want to say. March 27, 1995, Dr. George Brent. My name is Iris Sklar, and we're interviewing in Chicago, Illinois, USA, and the interview will be in English. My name is Iris Sklar, and I'm interviewing Dr. George Brent today in his home in Chicago, Illinois, USA, and the interview will be in English. Okay, I'd like to thank you first for allowing us to interview you today in your home. Would you please state your full name and any other name you were known as? My name is George William Brent. I was born uh, George Balasha or Georg Balasha or George Balasha, depending on the country I was in. Uh, I was born in Czechoslovakia, therefore my uh, Czech name was Jerzy Balasha, B-A-L-A-S-A. Jerzy was spelled J-I-R-I, and the Hungarian name was spelled G-Y-O-R-G-Y, -G -Y, with umlauts over the O's. George is the pronunciation, and everybody calls me in Hungarian, Yuri is like Georgie. In what city and I was, country? I was born in uh, Tachovo, Czechoslovakia, in the Podkarpatska Rus area, which is the Subcarpathian area of Czechoslovakia. <coughs> and uh, it's the most northeastern portion of, of, of the Czechoslovakia. At and that time. what year was that? It was August 30th, 1929. What was your home like life as a child? Well, I was born into a family of uh, a pharmacists. My father, Stefan Balasha, Balasha Istvan in Hungarian. I, uh, he was one of the f few uh, uh, professionals in the little town of 12,000 people. Although it was a small town, it was a uh, center of, uh, uh, it, it was sort of a county, county seat. And uh, besides my father, who was, of course, Jewish, there were a few, a couple of Jewish physicians, Jewish lawyers, and uh, these basically made up the intelligentsia of the little town. So I was born into this family. I was the firstborn son, so it was a big event. I was born in my own home. I didn't go, didn't take me to the hospital at that time. My mother didn't go to the hospital. I was born by a midwife. In attendance were both physicians because, of course, my father ex was expecting a child and he wanted to make sure that everything went okay. My mother's name uh, was uh, Heinal in Hungarian. They called her Heine. My father called her Heine. Her Hebrew name is Hinda. I may as well mention my Hebrew name. I was named after my two grandfathers, Zalman, who was my mother's father, and Yosef, my father's father, who both were already deceased when I was born. And my life was really a charm life. I um, we had a big old house with uh, the number of rooms I don't even remember anymore. It wasn't the traditional type of house that they built today, but it was a huge house with big walls, about 100 years old. The first thing my parents did, they got a nanny for me, and they imported a nanny from, from uh, Germany, the Sudetenland, although that was part of Czechoslovakia, but it was a very German area. Her name was Emma Schroeder. Schroeter, I believe, and she became my nanny, and I used to call her Teta. And the first words I probably spoke were German, and probably the second words I spoke was Hungarian, because my parents always conversed in Hungarian. So both languages were my mother tongue, so to speak. I spoke both languages quite fluently as a child. And uh, I remember very little for the first three, four years of my life till my brother was born in 1934. Little Peter was born. His birth wasn't as uneventful as mine. He, my mother went to the hospital and uh, she had a tough time delivering him. And when they brought him home, he was quite ill. And uh, there was a while when, uh, for a while, when we thought he may not even survive. But luckily we had a physician who was very progressive in his ways and what revived my little brother from his sickness, I remember he took some blood from my mother and injected it to my brother. Now, if in today's world of medicine, that would be an auto autogenous transfer of some immune system, I guess, that he did. And after the injection of my mother's blood, uh, my little brother recovered. 
and his name was Yankef Hersh, but in, Jew, in the Hebrew, when uh, a child is very ill, uh, they sometimes give him extra Jewish names or Hebrew names to make sure that he recover, and they gave him two extra names, Alter and Sholem, so Alter for, to should live an old, an old life, Alter meaning Alter in G Jewish, and Sholem meaning peace, so his real Hebrew name was Alter Sholem Yankef Hersh. And um, my mother was a, came from a very religious family, the Krauss family, uh, from the nearby little town of Bushtina, which was near Tachovo, where I was born. My father courted her while he was a pharmacist over there. He used to go down there by, by a horse-drawn carriage every night to court my mother. And she comes from a very, very large family of ten brothers and uh, ten, ten, five brothers and five sisters. She was a religious one. We kept kosher in our home. My father was much less religious, and I and my brother sort of followed my father's footsteps, and we indulged in things were not exactly kosher. And my mother fought us for a while, but after a while she just gave in, and she sort of set a table somewhere in the corner of the kitchen, and if we wanted to eat some chazerai, she allowed us to do that. We had a lot of, we had a lot of neighbors uh, who were, of course, peasants, a lot of Gentile people uh, who... Uh, brought us goodies when they had something to cook because my father, being the pharmacist, uh, did not always pay in, in cash, so they brought food and so on and so forth. And my father liked that kind of stuff, and so did I. So we all indulged in that kind of stuff. I started my elementary school education, I guess it was 1933, 34, when I was four or five years old, in the Czech language. I didn't, I don't believe I spoke Czech before that, but I picked it up very quickly, so in a matter of a year or so, I was able to speak three different languages. And as I remember, with all my friends, we did converse in the Czech language. Uh, as far as my religious upbringing, um, as they say, if there are two Jews in a town, they must have at least two temples or synagogues. We had the old, the big synagogue, which was where all the... Uh, more orthodox Jews went, although that, that was the only type of Jewish religion in our hometown, uh, over about, I would say, about 600 families. But the uh, little prayer room that we used to go to was closer to our house, and uh, it was made up of mainly more the professional people and some of the friends of my father. It was sort of a separate little, 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 little place where we used to go on the Shabbat. But uh, the women were separated there, too. There was no mingling of women and men uh, in, in, during the services. Uh, what I remember of my brother, he was a feisty little kid, uh, very skinny, blue-eyed, blonde, just the opposite of me. I was dark-eyed and dark hair. Terrible temper. He fought a lot. I mean, there was a lot of competition between us, but he was so good natured. And I remember my father always, my family made fun of him. I mean, he got away with a lot of things that I couldn't get away with, but he was the younger of the, of the family, so they allowed him to get away with a lot of things. So he threw tantrums and threw things and did kind of crazy things. Um, uh, my Hebrew education, or, or to learn Jewish, I didn't go to a cheder, although they had a cheder in, 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 in the town, and I mean, uh, the, the, the uh, Orthodox Jews, the, the kids wore the payas, the side locks, and they dressed very traditionally. On the Shabbat, I used to see everybody walk to the synagogue in their black kaftan and the uh, fur hat and, and the beard and so on and so forth. My father, of course, didn't have any hair on his, on his face, and we were more of the, well, there was no reform, but we were leaned towards more of the reform Judaism. Uh, although I didn't know what reform Judaism was at that time. But uh, we didn't keep the very orthodox traditions per se. Although at home, as I said, we had kosher. When Pesach came, I, my mother put away the dishes, and we had cleaned out everything, and she had her own Pesach dishes. It was a, a big event to all of a sudden eat out of different dishes with different utensils. It was a big event, and the Seder and everything else that went on in our house. Uh, as I started saying, I learned to read Hebrew, although I never really learned much about the Jewish tradition. I think I learned more about it since I am in America than I did before I came. I knew I was a Jew, but we had a bocher, as we called it, a, a young uh, a religious Orthodox Jew kid, who, young man, who used to come to our house. And on certain days, I had to sit, out, sit down with him, and he made me read out of a prayer book. 
and I used to read, and he used to correct me if I made a mistake, and that's how I learned to read, which I still do to this day, not knowing what I'm reading most of the time. I mean, when I go to the synagogue, I belong to a reform synagogue now, but when I go, I still do most of my reading in Hebrew. And uh, now I can pick up certain words, what they mean, but at that time it was just, just reading. And I remember when I used to go to services, I was always amazed how, how rapidly these people read. I used to have to listen for a particular word, and I tried to find where they are in, in the prayer, because nobody announced anything at those days. You know, there was a man who stood in front, and he was, did the praying, and everybody followed him. Of course, after a while, everybody knew what was going on, but I only went on the Shabbat and some high holidays. Um, as far as anti-Semitism goes in my hometown, while the Czechs, Czechs were there, honestly, I don't remember too much uh, discrimination against the Jews. We were thriving. I think Czechoslovakia was one of the few countries before World War II that really was quite democratic under the uh, presidency of Masaryk, who was, a, uh, who was trained in the United States. He even allowed... Um, uh, Hungarian language schools for those. We had a lot of Hungarian peasants there that were transplanted there from Hungary many, many hundreds of years ago, that their children should be able to learn in their native language or their mother's tongue, so to speak, in Hungarian. So they weren't forced to go to a Czech school, similar to what they do now with the bilingual education. And um, the uh, uh, clouds of war were gathering. I mean, I knew very little about Hitler. Hitler already came to power in 1933. Uh, there were rumors about things happening. I remember when he uh, uh, occupied the Rhineland. I remember there were some s stories about uh, in the news and what have you. But I, I really didn't feel discriminated against as a Jew, at least not to my knowledge or that I remember. My father, although he was a uh, officer in the uh, Austro-Hungarian army during World War I, was quite a Hungarian patriot. He always talked about the Hungarians, how different they are compared to the Czechs, how much more this and how much more that. I just kept hearing this in my home all the time. And of course, with my mother and my father, we conversed in Hungarian most of the time. Uh, little incidences that I remember when I went to my first grade. It was a big event. All my cousins came from the neighboring town, and uh, my, my cousin, who is now Israel, Martha, she survived the camps. Um, she was in there with her mother. Her mother passed away, but she's in, in Israel now. She came and she went with me to my first class in elementary school. And I remember after the first, I remember, she told me, and I remember vaguely, that the first day after I was in class, I went up to the teacher. I said, all right, I learned enough. Give me my certificate, and I want to go home. And that was it. So uh, I was a good student, although I, school wasn't the greatest thing that I look forward to, but nevertheless, uh, it, it was a rather charm life. I, li I lived a good life. We took some beautiful vacations, if I remember. My, my aunts, uh, my father's uh, aunts, my grandmother's sisters lived in Budapest. We took vacations to uh, Hungary, to the Balaton, which is the big lake in, 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 in Hungary, one of the biggest lakes. We went to Budapest. We stayed in the Royal, which was a big event. I mean, to see an elevator that carries you up to the floors. This was in my hometown. That was unheard of. The tallest building we had was about three stories. I mean, most buildings were just single-story buildings. Matter of fact, we had roads that were even unpaved. When it rained, it was just muddy. Finally, they put some cobblestones in on the main street and um, so that uh, when the rains came, people just did not uh, wa walk in the, in the mud. It was a typical small town. Um, I had a lot of friends, uh, both uh, Jewish and Gentile. I mean, we, we, we somehow got along fine. And I must mention the family that, that really lived with us and really raised me partly, the Dayak family. It was a family made up of Ruthenians. These were uh, not Hungarians, not Czechs. They were uh, a sort of a Ukrainian offshoot, a Russian, we call them Kish, Kish Orosok, or small Russians. And they really lived on our, I don't want to call it a compound because our home wasn't that large, but we had a little extra uh, place in the back of the yard, and this family lived there. It was uh, Anna, uh, John, her husband, uh, Elizabeth, the, the, the daughter, and, 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 and John, the, the young one, the son, who was approximately my age. 
And I remember Anna was my wet nurse. In those days, they did that. You know, when, when there was a, my mother didn't have enough milk, but she was uh, breastfeeding as well, so sometimes she nursed me as well. And this Yanni, as I called him, Janos, Yanni, the young fellow, became a very good friend of mine. And this family uh, worked for us. Uh, I don't know if my father paid them some money, but they lived in this place that belonged to us. Uh, she was the uh, uh, cook. She was the nursemaid. And uh, as she became as she became older, she became our cook as well. We always had servants around. It was rather common. My mother put in the order what she wants next day for dinner. And then they went out to the market to buy everything fresh, of course, and then they cooked it. On the Shabbat, my mother, of course, was in the kitchen making the chale. Always made little chales for the children, little little things for each, 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 each of us had a separate little chale. She lit the candles every Friday night, and uh, she had the chorant that she put away on Friday nights and went for it to the baker in the next day to pick it out of the oven. It was wonderful. I'm still looking for that taste in America. I haven't found it yet. My cousin says here, who is here now, he says he knows how to make it, but well, I'm still waiting for him to invite me for a taste of chont. Uh, we used to visit my uh, family in Bushtina, which is just five kilometers away. My mother's family were five, they were in the lumber building. They had a big lumber yard, and every son, the sons now, my five, the, the mother, my mother's five sisters were married in different parts of the country, but these five sons <coughs> all lived in this compound. It was truly a compound. Each man had his own house a few uh, hundred yards apart. It was a huge, huge uh, piece of land. And uh, we used to go up there on, on the Shabbat. There was always a big, big uh, Shabbat meal with the gefilte fish and, and the chaunt and the whole thing. And then there was on, uh, then we stayed over sometimes till Saturday, and they had a little brook running down there, and I remember I used to swim in it. It was a fun thing. And when I got older and I had a bicycle, I was able to bike down there myself and visit my family in that end. My mother was also was very close with them because she always went to visit, and when she went to visit Pristina, she always took me with. Or she went the other way, about eight kilometers, to Taratskurs, which is a little town east of us uh, on the Tissa River, where another sister of hers lived, the youngest sister, Lily. She was the closest of the sisters. Uh, the others were further away, and we didn't see them as often. My grandmother and my mother's father uh, lived in uh, Pleshivets, uh, which is in Slovakia, Slovakian portion of Czechoslovakia, with her other son, my uncle Emerick. He was a physician. And uh, he's, she spent six months with him, and she used to spend the winters with us. She used to always come down, and uh, I remember her quite well. She used to always read me the newspaper, and she smelled good, and she used to do a lot of crocheting. She was typical, typical European grandmother. She never wore anything other than but black since her mother died, and neither did the sisters that uh, I met after the war, and Nancy was with me in Budapest. Uh, uh, she can watch for that. They all were only black. I don't know. That was a craziness with them, but that's, that's the way they were. So time was on. Uh, uh, 1934, 35, 36, I was first, second, third, fourth year in, in my elementary education. Spoke the Czech language perfectly. I, at home, I spoke either German to Teta, to the nanny, or Hungarian to my parents. So it was, came kind of fluently. I was able to switch back and forth with all the languages. I, to this day, I can recommend that children should learn it early. They'll never forget it. Maybe it'll get rusty. Of course, I forgot to check because I didn't speak it. But I, I think it would come back to me if I tried it. So uh, 1938 rolled around where things started getting a little bit hairy. Um, there were rumors, of course, of Hitler uh, <coughs> trying to partition Czechoslovakia. I remember my aunt, who lived in Moravska Ostrava, in, in Ostrava, which is in the, Bohemi or in the uh, Bohemian section of, of, of Czechoslovakia, came to visit, and I remember she told us, well, she came with her son and daughter, and her husband had to flee because of the anti-Semitism and the anti-Jewish actions already at that time in that portion of of, of Czechoslovakia. 
I uh, it was 38. I remember I had an appendicitis attack. They had to drive me to a nearby town. There was no hospital where I was. <clears throat> and uh, the surgeon who, s who operated on me uh, was of Hungarian uh, background, but he was the best available, at least my parents thought so. And I remember he had to operate because he was Hungarian and not Czech. There was already this pulling back and forth and animosity and hostility between Hungarians and the Czechs. He had to operate in an oper operating room that was reserved for people who had infectious conditions. That was crazy in those days. I mean, there's a separate operating room, and if you had a, a, a sepsis, then they operated you in this room. If you were just an ordinary operation without infection, they operated you in this way. That's the way they did in those days. But I remember they brought me home soon because, uh, earlier than they should have, because of the political situation. And I remember my uh, incision opened up on the way home in the car. And then the beginning of end of 1938, when Hitler took over Bohemia and Moravia, and Slovakia became independent, there was a nationalistic Ukrainian movement in our area. These were not the Soviet Ukrainians. These were nationalist, fascist Ukrainians. We had to take the sign of the drugstore that was uh, Lekarna in Czechoslovakia off, and we had to put a blue and yellow signed apteka, I think was the Ukrainian term for the, for the pharmacy. And um, it had to be written in the Cyrillic alphabet, the Russian Cyrillic alphabet. And I had to start going from a Czech school to a Ukrainian school. And uh, <laughs> I learned to write the Cyrillic language and even speak some Ukrainian. But their rule was very short. In March of 1939, uh, the Hungarians, Hitler dismembered Czechoslovakia completely. And the Hungarians marched into our hometown. I remember it was, I think, March 16th or something like that, 1939. Uh, my father was elated, the big Hungarian. He even had a Hungarian flag hidden under the tea leaves in his pharmacy. We sold a lot of tea and these, these home remedies that they used in those days. And we were the first ones to be able to hoist the Hungarian flag above our house to greet the liberating, quote, unquote, Hungarian troops. Little did, little did we know what's waiting for us with these, 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 for better word, bastards. But I remember my father, on the, my first day in the Hungarian school, he made sure that I learned the Hungarian national anthem and I learned the Hungarian patriotic uh, songs. And when I went to school, I was a fantastically trained Hungarian kid already. And of course, the language was no problem. I just continued in my fourth year of elementary school, started in Czech, continued Ukrainian, finished it in Hungarian. My, f my brother started his schooling as well. He wasn't a very good student. I mean, he, he somehow just never wanted to study. I remember he, my father used to have fights with him. When my father came home from the pharmacies, I used to sit there and uh, tell him what my uh, lesson was for the day, and, and, and I knew it verbatim. My, my little brother would, wouldn't cooperate. But when it came to exams, he always was able to pass the examination somehow. <sighs> I finished my four years of elementary school. Now, in, in, in Europe, it's a little bit diverse. You don't go for eight years, and then high school and college. It's four-year elementary, then eight years of gymnasium, and then the university. Well, there was no gymnasium in my hometown. There was what they called in Hungarian a polgári iskola, meaning it was a public, polgári meaning public school, uh, which was a fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, uh, leading to either a trade or if you wanted to transfer to a university, to do a gymnasium, you could do that. <coughs> I f did the first two years there, and my father, of course, wanted me to go to the university somewhere, and in order to do that, you have to go to the gymnasium. <laughs> he was in good friends with many Gentiles in my hometown with a lot of poor. This, one of them was the bishop of the uh, Protestant uh, sect there. They, they were mainly, they call them reformatus, reformed, but they were mainly Calvinists. He was the bishop, 
And in 1940, Romania seceded the northern portion of Transylvania to Hungary. And Maramar Siget, or Maramarosh as they call it now, about 30 kilometers east and across the Tisza River from us, had a um, parochial a gymnasium. It was a reformatus or a Protestant uh, high school, if you will. And I remember uh, with his school, I was one of two Jews who were allowed to go to that school. By that time, there were anti-Jewish laws passed, 1940, 1941. And in some of them were even stricter than the Nuremberg laws in Germany. The, uh, many of the Jews in my hometown had to give up their businesses. They weren't allowed to own stores. Land was forbidden. As soon as the war the war broke out when Hungary joined Germany on the side of Germany against the Russians. Uh, we had to give up our radios. Jews were not allowed to have a radio. Uh, my father was pretty much left alone simply because they needed a pharmacist in the town. He was the only one in that uh, little county. People from far away in the neighboring villages came there to get their medication. And it was open, theoretically, 24 hours a day. While it was attached to our house, uh, he was on duty all the time. And if somebody rang the bell in the middle of the night, he had to get up and give the medication. Later on, we built a pharmacy at the main square. And uh, he got a assistant pharmacist. I mean, he was a pharmacist, but helped my father. And he slept at the pharmacy there, so at night, if somebody needed something, He's the one who served them, so my father could come home. And I used to, sh sh in shift, one came and ate, then my f he went back, my father came home in the evening, and then he stayed. <clears throat> I lost my thought for a moment, but, oh, you know, about the laws, yes. So when I started going to the gymnasium in uh, Maramar Siget, that's where I really started feeling that I am a Jew, anti-Semitism. There were the young kids who were sons of the so-called Vites. Vites meant the hero of the Hungarian whatever it was. I mean, so some of these titles were given and were very important to some people. Uh, if, if somebody was called Vites, that means he was a Hungarian, had a Hungarian ancestry who were a hero somewhere along the line in the history of Hungary. So the young bunch of kids there who were uh, nationalistic, chauvinistic Hungarians, who couldn't stand Jews. And I was called many names and beaten upon. And I had to really perform in this school because the only way I could stay in this gymnasium if I had pretty good grades. I remember they had uh, religious classes uh, once, twice a week. And as is myself and this other Jewish kid, we had to leave, of course. And, uh, but we had to have religious training. So we had to go to this rabbi's house. And he gave us the Hebrew, the Jewish religion, and tested us on these things, and we had to get a grade in that. But the rest of them had their uh, religious training right there in school. That was 1942 and three. I was in my third and fourth year of gymnasium. I finished both of those years in Matiselka, in, in, in Marmar Siget. It was about 30 kilometers from my hometown. I, uh, at first, I stayed with my aunt in this town, but I didn't like it, so I commuted. I had to get up every morning at 5 o'clock, catch a train at 6 o'clock, was at the station in Maramorosh by 7, 7.15, walked to the school, stayed till 2 o'clock, went back to the train station, caught the 3 o'clock train, was back in my home about 4.30, 5 o'clock, had something to eat, did my lessons. Father came home, I had to tell him what I learned that day. Went to bed at 9 o'clock, was up again at 6 o'clock. And this was going on six days a week, not five days a week like in America. So there wasn't much time for, for, for play while I was in the gymnasium. And the, the courses were tough. I had to learn Latin. I had to learn uh, uh, German. Uh, I had to learn Romanian because it was a Romanian area. So they kept me busy. Uh, I started my fifth grade in 1944. And by that time, the Hungarian government, which was quite anti-Semitic, still did not let the Jews to be taken from Hungary. Select Jews were taken. There was a neighbor of ours who was not a Hungarian citizen. He was from Galicia. I remember they, 
were in the dry goods business. My father had an empty storeroom where the old pharmacy was, and they stored all his dry goods. So when they come back, they should have it. And the whole family was deported east towards Poland or Galicia, whatever it is. And I'm sure that what happened, as I know now, they turned them over to the Germans, and they probably were exterminated. That's what they did with non-national Hungarians. They just chased them across the border. The Germans were there. They took a hold of them, and of course, they usually killed them. Um, as a young man, uh, of over, I think, 12 or 13 years old, if you were Gentile, you had to join the uh, a, a paramilitary group. They trained you to become soldiers. They were called Levante. If you were a Jew, you still had to join, but they trained you to become a laborer. In other words, Jews were not allowed to serve the Hungarian army as soldiers, fighting soldiers. They were in the labor battalion. And they used these uh, Jews to uh, dig uh, anti-tank ditches or cannon fodder or whatever it is. And thousands of them died during the winter of 1941, 1942 uh, in the Russian winter when the Russians and the Hungarians were fighting on the German side against the Russians. And I think uh, that's how I lost my uncle, the physician, uh, who was in the labor battalion, labor service. And I, from what I understand, both his legs and, and hands were frozen and he refused amputation and he just died of, 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 of gangrene. So I was in my, started my fifth grade of high school or gymnasium in uh, Spring, I was in the spring of 1944, when finally Hitler decided that he doesn't want to fool around with the present Hungarian government, uh, who, which was led by uh, the regent Horthy and his prime minister, I don't remember his name anymore. But these guys were not Jew lovers, but somehow they didn't let the Germans come and take the Jews en masse like they did in other countries. But by March 1944, Hitler said it's enough of this stuff, and he just marched in with his troops, replaced the uh, uh, government with uh, puppets, Hungarian puppets of the uh, Arrow Guards, uh, Arrow Cross Party, which was like the Nazi party of the Hungarians. And the fun began. All of a sudden, the uh, gendarmes that were the usual people we saw in our hometown, who were the regular order, kept order in our hometown, were replaced by people we never saw before. We found out later all these people were trained somewhere else in Hungary just for this purpose, to round up Jews and eventually deport them. Ghettos were set up in a part of my hometown uh, by the beginning of April. And uh, from our neighboring little villages, the true shtetls, all the Jews were brought there. The Gentiles were made to move, and the Jews were transported into these areas. But for the next three or four weeks, uh, myself and a few other Jews uh, were still allowed to live in our own homes, and go on pretty, well, not pretty much with our lives, but we were allowed to live in our, home ta our home, homes because, uh, basically because my father was the only pharmacist. They didn't have a replacement for him, and somebody had to serve the people. The same thing was true of the physicians as well, the two Jewish physicians, Dr. Kellerman and Dr. Greenstein, and also the other pharmacists that worked for my father. So we all had to, uh, we all were allowed to stay out of the ghetto, although we had to wear a yellow star. All Jews had to wear yellow stars. I remember, I don't know what I was thinking about, but there was a soccer match once, and I, I tried to go on a soccer match, uh, to try to attend the soccer game, and I had a raincoat type of thing, and I threw it over my shoulder to cover my yellow star. And of course, I couldn't fool anybody. It was a small town. Everybody knew I was a Jew, so they made fun of me, and they heckled me, and they made me take my coat off and expose the yellow star. We weren't allowed to uh, walk on the streets uh, after a certain number of hours. There was a curfew for Jews. So we walked behind the buildings. There was a little creek that, flew, uh, that was flowing on the back of our home and along other homes, and so uh, myself and a few other kids who were still playing together were running around there, and that was our entertainment. In the meantime, uh, we, heard, we heard things about Jews being deported, uh, that, that from the neighboring towns they were put in a different ghetto, and, and then they were taken somewhere. But the, the rumor had it 
that all Jews from Hungary, that the, that the Hungarians were afraid, that the Russians getting closer, and we were so close to the Russian border that they're going to hurt the Jews. There'll be some fighting. And why would they worry all of a sudden about hurting Jews? I don't know. But we believed anything that, would, that sounded good to us, that they want to bring us to the center of Hungary and we're going to be living there with families and we're going to be working there. And when the war is over, we'll go back where we were. Well, May, end of May, May 20th or so arrived. And I remember a Monday morning, there was a knock on the door. The strange gendarme was there, tell, told us to pack everything. And within an hour, we have to move into the ghetto. Well, uh, trying to remember some of the details of it. I remember my mother and father were clearly very upset. Matter of fact, my father talked to us about suicide. He had some poison with him. And he suggested that we all take it and, and die, of course. Uh, my f brother and I didn't think it was such a good idea. I mean, a 10-year-old kid and a 14-year-old kid didn't think dying is so nifty. So we started crying, and so I guess they gave up the idea. While we gathered our things, the neighbors, uh, the, the Gentile neighbors, the kids came and uh, took what they wanted. They said, well, you won't need this now. Why don't you let me take it? And they just started taking things from us. Um, our neighbor, a peasant from across the street, uh, had a um, oxen carriage, or uh, it was sort of like wagon with, drawn by oxen. He came over and we packed what we could, some mattresses, some food and what have you on it. And uh, uh, following this, this, this ox drawn, uh, there was a carriage, it was a cart, uh, we moved into the ghetto. Um, going from a, a big house with all the amenities that, that you can imagine, all of a sudden they assigned us to a room that we had to share with I don't know any other people. There were no furnishings, just the mattresses on the floor. Um, the first time my mother ate anything that wasn't kosher, I remember. Uh, the Dayak family that lived with us, they came and through the gates there, they, they gave us some food. And that was on Monday night that we moved in. Tuesday, we were in the ghetto. We didn't stay very long. Wednesday, they came and they took us to the train station. They marched us, families, children. They had uh, Hungarian gendarmes standing there with guns and machine guns along the road that led from the ghetto to the uh, rail station. And people always ask, well, how could you just walk and not fight? Could you do something knowing that they take you somewhere? Well, first of all, we didn't know where they was taking us. There were, we didn't know about concentration camps. We didn't know about killings or exterminations. Second of all, even if we would have wanted to go somewhere, show me somebody who's such a hero that is going to rush these guys with machine guns, and here you have the whole family with you, and you're going to expose them to the fact that they're going to be massacred or slaughtered right there. They probably would. I found out later, before they took us away, all the elders of our town, the Jews, were beaten, trying to beat uh, confessions out of them or information out of them where they were hiding their jewelry, et cetera, et cetera, because we also had to uh, give up our jewelry. My father gave some of the good stuff to one of his, quote, friends, unquote, a banker who wasn't a Jew. His name is Shufrich. I still remember his name. And then he gave a small packet of ju jewelry that wasn't very valuable just so he complies with the orders of the of the. Uh, government of the uh, military people. So a lot of my father's friends were beaten. And the way they beat them, they, they beat them on the soles of their feet. So you couldn't see the beatings. But when you get beat with a truncheon on the soles of your feet, it hurts. I don't know what they told them, if there was anything to tell. But we spent Wednesday night at the train station. Uh, it, it, was, it wasn't in the station, it was in a, it's like a warehouse where, where they kept uh, the livestock before they put them on, on, on the trains and so on and so forth. And it's sort of blurred to me, but I remember it was just packed, people packed in this small area. And uh, the next morning there was a train made up of boxcars standing, and they loaded us on those boxcars. And all the, our neighbors were out there looking at us like some, some freaks being shipped away. Few of them had tears in their eyes. Some of them, I guess, had some feelings. The Dayak family was there, and they were crying. They handed us some food. All we had in there was about 100 people in that boxcar, jammed together. 
there was a pot for to use for for bodily needs and there was a mother pot with water and that was it and the train started moving and uh, there were some horrible things happening in there. There were some suicides. Some some people took their lives, uh, taking poison. They weren't quite dead yet, but they were. You know, you go, you don't die immediately from morphine. It takes a long time. They were throwing up. The, the, some women, of course, were very modest. Didn't want to go to the John to the last minute. And then there was always a thing: don't look and cover me and look this. And the smell was awful. Um, my mother was sitting uh, on the short end of the box. I remember on the floor, and I was had my head in her lap with my brother and uh, a good friend of mine's parents who was always a disciplinary was still yelling at him while they were taking us away and I, I said to my father why the hell doesn't he just shut up already leave his son alone I mean but he just couldn't uh, but he did that of frustration or I don't know but he just continued abusing him even <laughs> while they were taking us away uh, it, it was just a, a nightmare, uh, that, that, that trip from Thursday morning till about Saturday. We pretty well knew that we're not going to the middle of, of Hungary, the center of Hungary, because we reached a little town uh, where the rail split, and we were familiar with this. And if we went to the left, it would have meant Hungary. To the right, it went to Slovakia, and we crossed Slovakia. And some towns uh, we hit that were familiar to us, and uh, it, 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 it indicated that we're going towards the Polish border. At that time, it was the ger general government of, of Germany. It wasn't really Poland anymore. And we crossed the Tatra Mountains, I remember, uh, sometimes uh, fr late Friday, early Saturday morning. And uh, I think we arrived in either, I'm not sure if it was Krakow or Katowice, one of the two towns with a K. The train uh, stopped for a while, and then it started moving again. A short while later, I never forget. My father looked out this this little window that was uh, barred off in the box car, and he he saw this sign, and he said, "Maybe we're in Germany," because in German Gothic letters that word Auschwitz was written on the train station. Of course, the name meant nothing to us. We did never heard of it. We didn't know what what the heck is going to happen. And after the train stopped for a while, the train moved again for a little while on a siding, and uh, we arrived, uh, as I know now, in, in Birkenau, which is Auschwitz II, they called it, or Birkenau. Uh, many pictures are we've seen of the railroad with the big gate and all that. And uh, with a big bang and clang, the doors were thrown open, and the screaming, rouse, rouse, uh, schnell, schnell, mach los, mach los, jeder rouse. And I remember my brother and my f mother got off, and they were somebody screaming that, uh, don't worry, we will we'll take your baggage, and we all meet in camp again, in the camp later on. Children and mothers this way, and, and uh, older people this way, and so on. So, so we got off, and I never saw my brother and mother again. That was it. Uh, she was gone. I mean, I know what happened to them, but at that time. The last I saw them, their chance to say goodbye or anything. I uh, got off the train and I stood there around with my father, and that picture in that Auschwitz album that I have there. Uh, all of a sudden, the uh, uh, Germans started screaming that all professional people stand separately here, and and uh, they started taking pictures of us, not of them, not me. And then they marched us. Oh, no, no, they didn't march us yet. They, they made us walk in front of this SS man uh, who selected, was pointing one way or the other. And I guess I was only 14 and a half, but I must have been, seemed old enough anyhow. They, he pointed to the left, I remember, and uh, my father and I, we crossed those railroad tracks and we marched us into the camp where they took our clothes and uh, made a shower. They shaved our heads. And, and, and gave us uh, these striped uh, uh, uniforms with long pants. And I made a comment to my father. He says, this is the first pair of long pants I've got in my life and had to be in Auschwitz. Um, I still didn't know what really was going on. I mean, uh, there was an awful stench. And there were the, the crematorium weren't that far away. I mean, the, I knew there were crematorium now. I didn't know it then. 
but it is spewing forth the, 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 the smoke and the flames and the, the, the stink of, of, of flesh. And there's an interesting thing that I noticed. They try to mask the smell with something that smelled like orange blossoms. To this day, I get the shivers. When I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, and I go to Scottsdale, the smell of orange blossoms reminds me of Auschwitz. It's just a crazy thing. They must have used that to try to mask the smell of this, 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 this burning, burning human, humanity there. And it didn't take very long to find out really what was going on because the people who already were there for a while uh, were very eager to tell everybody that uh, there's your little brother, there's your all going up in smoke. That uh, We asked them, where are the children? I mean, I didn't see any children, really children. And they told us, well, they are dead. That's where, that's where they're going up in, in, in the smoke. <coughs> and as fortunate as I was, uh, my uncle, Izho Shimshovich, who lived in the little town of Teretz Talaskur, just eight kilometers from me, were married to my mother's younger sister, got there about a week or two before we did. Now, before I get to that, I only stayed with my father for one day. As a young kid, they separated me and put me in the children's barracks. They were all kids between the ages of maybe 14 and a half, 15, 16 years old. And my father was uh, separated. And I remember on, uh, on that evening, he came to, found out the barrack I mean, he came to say goodbye to me. And he said that they are shipping him to Warsaw to clean up the uh, ghetto that was destroyed uh, the year before, in 1943, when the ghetto uprising occurred. I remember hugging and kissing him, and he said, well, don't forget me. And that was it. That's, uh, I haven't seen my dad then for a long time after that. And uh, somehow my uncle, Ijo, got a whiff of the fact that I was somewhere there, and he seeked me out. And he was always a very um, able person to, to, to find things that would make his life easier. And he became a Schreiber. A Schreiber in German means a scribe or he was in charge of, of, of keeping track of the number of people in each barracks, uh, making up uh, work commandos. He worked in a, in a hut or a barracks right up front of the, that particular the D camp I was in at that time in Birkenau. And he, uh, he had civilian clothes on, but the clothes uh, had a in thick red oil that was a big mark on the side of it and a, on the back of it so that you just couldn't walk out or, or use it as a civilian clothes. You would have been detected immediately. And uh, people think that everybody in Auschwitz was tattooed. It's not so. They didn't tattoo you till they picked you for labor. That was almost like a reprieve. Uh, they gave you life if you were tattooed. So I wasn't tattooed immediately. I was just part of the mass of humanity that wasn't killed immediately. For whatever reason, they left us, let us live, uh, the young kids, in a barracks of 16-year-olds. And we didn't do a darn thing for months at a time. I mean, for, from for about May till, I would say, August, it was just shuffling us back and forth from one barracks to another, one camp to another. At first, we were right next to the uh, sea camp, which was the Hungarian women's camp. I remember we tried to communicate with these women. Uh, screaming through the barbed wire, the electrified barbed wire, and everybody was looking for somebody if they'd known them. And I was trying to find my mother. Um, of course, she wasn't there. I, I, I managed to find a woman, a young young girl about my age, who was from my hometown, and she said, no, she isn't here. And my uncle came to the barracks and told us, or told me, that, uh, well, it's a good idea if today you go to a different barracks because there'll be a selection tonight. That meant that they selected people. But I was basically with these young kids, and they put us from the D lager first to the A lager, which was a quarantine lager. It was a half a lager. And most of these lagers had these, these uh, they were like stables on both sides of the street. This one had only one. Then they put us to the gypsy camp, the e lager. That was the only place where families stayed together. The gypsies were there still as families, children, mothers, everything. And I still wasn't working. I was just kept around. For what reason, I don't know. There were kids from my barracks who were taken when they got sick. We had scarlet fever. I already had it earlier, so I didn't get it again. But those who got sick, they just took them out, and you never saw them again. I mean, I'm sure they must have killed them. Now, sometimes in August, the, uh, there was a Absperre, they called it. They just uh, closed the barracks. 
And we heard the trucks come, and there was a lot of screaming. That's when they liquidated the, the gypsy camp. All the, work, the, the men who were able to work were taken already. And what was left over were those children and women and the older. And of course, these, they, they've been there for a year or two, and they knew what was going on. And they put on a fight. I mean, they, they didn't just voluntarily got on the trucks and went to the gas chamber. They, they screamed and they tried to hide. Some of them hide in, in the latrines. I mean, I think in, in, sorry, in Schindler's List, there was a kid who jumped into the latrine. No, it wasn't common, I mean, to save your life. They did that. They fished them out later and they put them to death later. It doesn't matter. So by the next morning, the other half of the camp was empty. There was nobody there. They just they saw the burning of the corpses. I mean, they didn't see the corpses themselves. They saw the chimneys working full time again, and there was again the smoke and the flames and the smell. <coughs> and so my uncle was very much uh, in, 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 uh, instrumental in keeping me alive while I was there. Uh, our regime was in the morning. They gave us, first of all, we had to stand on the apple plots. They had to count us every morning. We had to stand in fives. The block tester or the leader of the barracks counted us, reported to the rapport Führer who was an assessment, and then he reported to the lager Führer. And if the numbers were correct, you were dismissed an hour or so later. If it wasn't, you stood there till they found the missing person, dead or alive, didn't matter. Escapes were unheard of. There were a few, I, I found out later, there were some who escaped from Auschwitz. Uh, some Czech guy, a Verba, or whoever it was, but not too many of them managed to do it. To do it. And besides, where the hell would you have gone? I mean, I, I, didn't, sp I didn't know anybody. The Poles weren't that friendly to the Jews if you, if you escaped. They would have probably turned you over to the Germans anyway. But as time went on, all of a sudden, about the end of August, first part of September, the, I remember the holidays came around, and uh, I did celebrate Kol Nidre in one of the barracks. And I became a very frommer. I, I, I never was very religious, but I got a little siddur, a little leather bound little siddur. And f I don't know whether I was just scared. There was nothing better to do. But in the barracks with his children, we didn't do anything. I started uh, praying. I was able to recite my morning prayer at noon, in the evening, after the meals, before the meals. I was I, all of a sudden, I of course, I think deep inside I hope that if I pray enough, my God will save me. And after the holidays, all of a sudden, uh, my uncle wasn't there anymore. And I found out that he joined voluntarily to get out of this, this mess that was Auschwitz or Birkenau uh, on a labor transport that went to a nearby town uh, called uh, Riddeltau, which was in, in, in Silesia, Oberschlesia, and it was a coal mining town. And uh, Auschwitz supplied the manpower to this area to do the coal mining. Well, I just didn't want to stick around in Birkenau, so the first time I got whiff of the fact that there is a transport leaving for Riddeltown, there was an SS sergeant uh, who was somehow not too bad of a guy. There was some SS, I mean, none of them were very good, but some were worse than others. And this one apparently knew my uncle, and somehow he got message to me that he's over there. And I volunteered for the next transport that left for it. And once I was selected for the transport, that's when I got my tattoo. And it was a badge of honor. I was thrilled. I got there too. That means I'm going to be working. They're not going to kill me right away. I won't have to worry about it. They loaded us on a truck, and uh, it was in a couple of hours' distance. I don't think it was very far. They took us to Ridulta, which was a, not a labor camp. There was no extermination going on there. People who died, they just shipped them back to Auschwitz and burned them in the crematoriums there. They beat people to death, yes, of course. And then my uncle saw me, he said, boy, I can't escape you. Just follow me all over the world. I said, well, listen, I'm no dummy. I'm trying to, to, to get your help again. And he managed to get me a job as a, an orderly to the SS. Now, that was a wonderful job. First of all, it started getting cold. I didn't have to work outside. I was allowed to be indoors in the SS barracks, taking care of their immediate need. Uh, there were about six to a room, these SS people, the guards. I cleaned their room. I shined their shoes. They even gave me the rifles to clean. Now, no bullets in it, but, you know, I did that. I uh, was able to eat better because these people, of course, ate better than we did. And there were leftovers. And there were some SS people who were 
conscripted into the SS, the older ones. You know, the SS was not all the blue-eyed, blonde Aryans you see on the posters, on the Nazi posters. There were some old people taken out of Wehrmacht and stuck into the SS to guard the camps. And some of them didn't like the idea anymore, and they got packages from home, so there was always a little bit trickling down to me, and I was able to eat better. So I didn't lose weight, and I was still fairly strong. I was just hoping that I was able to keep my job with them, because periodically the, the leader of this... Uh, SS Barracks came over, and he was a hardcore SS, and he used to check the cleanliness of the room with a white glove, and if they found the smallest amount of dust, he just beat you or kicked you out and put you in their coal mines. And working in the coal mines meant that you worked on your knees. They gave you these pads. They went down, and for 12 hours a day, you were on your knees uh, shoveling coal. I mean, it was a horrible existence. Food was so-so. even to I, I ate pretty well, and the ones in the camp and the regular... Uh, prisoners, they it wasn't terrific, but but it was better than Birkenau Auschwitz. And this was going on through January 1945, when uh, rumors of the Russians getting closer to Auschwitz uh, started surfacing. And somewhere on the line, we also months later we found out, of course, that the Allies landed in Normandy and uh, that that things aren't looking good for the Germans, but we couldn't tell as far as the treatment they gave us was the same as it was before. There was no difference. And they started, I remember on a January cold morning, they just put us in, in into a, oh, before I go further, <laughs> it was a, being in a work commando, as they called it, we didn't work inside the camp itself in Ridulta. Every morning, four young fellows who worked in this SS barracks had to march out through the front gate and announce to the SS standing at the front gate that Arbeitskommando, I don't know what the number was, mit vier Menschen marschieren zum Ausgang, meaning we are leaving. And at the evening we had to come back and say the same thing. It marched in steps and there's some music sometimes and it was a very military type of thing. Just, just got to my head how, how, how people marched, these commandos marched out of the camp to the coal mines and what have you, and you had to report to the guy. And of course there was an uh, armed guard on your side that marched with you to the place of work with a rifle and so on and so forth. So anyway, the Russians come closer, they marched us. In the middle of January I uh, had, by that time they took away my shoes that I had, leather shoes, and I had these wooden clouds with some canvas on top. and whatever the coats I had on me, they marched us in the snow. It was snowing. It was cold. I was tired. And the damn snow kept sticking to these wooden clods. And, and, and you had to stop every five seconds just to kick the snow off. Otherwise, you fall on your face. It was like walking on high heel shoes. How I managed to march that, uh, from, from Auschwitz to Katowice, I don't know the exact distance, but it, it lasted at least the whole night and part of the morning terribly cold. I, I, you learn to sleepwalk. You just, you just walk and, and you sleep and you walk and you sleep. You don't know what's going on. I heard shots fired. Uh, people who couldn't make it, they were sh fired upon and killed on the roadside. They got us to Katowice and there was a train standing there with open coal bins, these coal uh, square, square boxcars, but no roof on them. They just open. They loaded in, us into these cars. No food, no water. I remember we melted snow to use as water to drink, huddled together, and the train started moving. Uh, some uh, were s either smart or daring. They jumped over the top and let themselves down and somehow managed to slip between the rails and, and when the train passed over them, if it was dark, they some, some got away. Some of them were caught by somebody. The SS were on the trains and they watched this and if they could see somebody, they just shot them, of course. Well, I didn't do either. I just sat there and, and froze, I guess, and did the best I could. And we passed through, from Katowice to uh, Ostrava to, the, to, to Czechoslovakia, and we arrived in Austria at Mauthausen. I don't know if you saw a picture of Mauthausen. I've been there twice since my liberation. I went there with Nancy and... Uh, it's a fortress. I mean, it's built on the Danube. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's made of stone. It's a quarry. And they uh, 
unloaded the train. They put us on some uh, trucks and took us to the uh, camp, Mauthausen. It was cold. God, it was cold. And uh, I, they, they, they let us stand there, right next to the gate. There's an area, and just let us stand there, freezing. Then they put us in, into the shower, and they this cold water. And then after cold water, they chased us out naked in the in, in wet before they gave us some other clothes. And by that, we were so tired. We were hungry. Uh, I remember uh, how it came by, but one of the, the leader of one of the barracks saw me. Uh, I must have looked terrible, a young kid. said, come on in and, and get some sleep. And he put me in a warm room under a table. There was a little space. I don't think I slept as well since <laughs> that time. I, it was fantastic. But we didn't stay in Mauthausen very long. Um, a few days later, about a week later, they put us on trucks and shipped us to a new camp near Mauthausen, which was part of the Mauthausen area called Ebensee. Many people died after liberation from overeating uh, or the water pollution that was, uh, I had diarrhea, whether it was from the eating or was it that I, I had, I had uh, hepatitis. Uh, a, I had hepatitis B, I had every damn disease that you could catch in those, under those circumstances. Um, about, it was about May 2nd, I believe, about one or two days later, all of a sudden we see that a olive-colored truck or car, like a jeep, I guess a jeep was, it crashes through the gate and rides through the camp and leaves again. And about an hour later we see this caravan of troops coming. They were American 7th Army. And they came with the trucks with the Red Cross cars. And of course, they already saw camps before, so they knew what they, will ex what they expected to find there. And uh, that's how liberation occurred. It was, uh, well, it was fantastic. I was still just, the only thing I was interested in was eating. I mean, and the Americans wouldn't let us roam the countryside. I mean, we could have gone into the little towns, and, and the Germans were so scared of us, they would have given us anything we wanted. Some of them went, and they got rich, just taking anything they wanted. But the Americans didn't want to do this. The Russians allowed the inmates of camps to go anywhere they wanted to and do anything they wanted to the Germans, but the, the Americans didn't allow it. They set up these, the, the hospitals wasn't, in, what we had, there was no hospital to speak of. So they came in and set up these tents, hospital tents, for those who couldn't walk anymore. I mean, they were just skeletons. Uh, people were ill with, with all kinds of diseases. Um, I volunteered, and I could hardly stand, and when I volunteered to be a orderly in one of these barracks, because I knew I was going to be able to eat more food, I was getting food. And I, I was, it was not because I was humanitarian on my part. I wasn't interested in so much helping these poor people. I was a poor person myself on the verge of, 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 die, of death. But I knew that these people cannot eat anymore. So whatever they didn't eat, I could eat. So if they got a, I, I, I devoured a chicken and a half. I mean, I, I, just, I just, just stuffed myself. It was going in one end and out the other. I remember I, I used to have a satchel full of food, I used to sit on the latrine and eat, and it was coming through me. I mean, just diarrhea. For about three, four months after liberation, I had diarrhea. I stayed in Ebenzee for about, I, I wish I knew exactly. It was probably end of May, first part of June, when the Americans said, well, we have to repat repatriate you now. We have to send you home where you came from. Well, I was a kid of, uh, what was that, 15 years old? It wasn't even 16 years. No, it was May, May of 1945. Was, uh, what, May 45, uh, I was 16. Okay. Not quite 16, 15 and a half. So they took us by truck to Linz, Oh, they took us by truck to Linz, to Vienna, by train. Uh, the trains weren't running yet. There was no train. I mean, occasionally a train went, and everybody tries to pile on the train going east. People were s sitting, crawling through the windows. I was sitting on top of a train. There were soldiers. There was Russians. There was Americans. There were refugees trying to go forward, backwards. I was going towards Budapest, from, uh, from uh, Bratislava to Budapest. And I arrived in Budapest in June sometimes. It was a hot day. I didn't have my uniform on anymore, the striped uniform. What I did, I 
got a German soldier's uniform. I didn't have shoes, but I found a pair of boots that the German flyers used. They were lined with fleece. So in the middle of June, wearing one of those hot boots, my feet swelled like crazy, but that's all I had. So when I arrived in Budapest, that's all I had on me. They took us to the uh, uh, resettlement centers run by the uh, Hungarian Jewish organization. Uh, I think it's called Omja, the Orsagos Magyar Zsidó Aktio, I guess it meaning uh, national, uh, national Hungarian Jewish organization. There they gave me 100 pengers, which was the money f in Hungary at that time, worth very little, and a suit of clothes, a jacket and a pair of pants. But before I put that on, I uh, remember the address of my aunt, my mother's, uh, my, my grandmother's sister, my, my, my father's aunt, where she lived. So I just took off on foot and I got to her place. She lived in a beautiful villa. She was very well to do. And I marched in there and I said, uh, where is Ilona, Ilona Steiner? Uh, she said, well, she's visiting your, her sister, Ella, who was another sister living in a different place. So I, again, on foot, I went up to her place. And they live on the second floor and I was coming in through the gate up on the bottom of the stairs and Ilona was just coming down on the stairs and I'm standing there in my German uniform and I look at Ilona and I say, um, don't you recognize me? She says, no, who are you? So I told him, I'm, I'm Yuri from Teacher, Yuri Balashev. Well, a shrai, a screaming, and Ella, Ella, Arpa, that's the husband, he was a physician. But, uh, guess who is here from, from Teacher? So, of course, it was a big reunion. And I decided to stay in Budapest for a little while. And while I was in Budapest, the Red Cross sent notice to my aunts that my father is alive. He wrote a little letter that he's alive but very sick. He contracted tuberculosis and pleurisy and you name it. And he was in a sanatorium in, in Germany near uh, Munich. He said, don't write. There was no postal service at that time. Transportation was unheard of. So I stayed with my aunts for about three months. I decided to go home to see my hometown. I really wanted to see just what's there. So I got on a train on my, it was August, on my birthday, August 30th, 1945, and I took the train back to my hometown. The borders were still open. You can still travel. And I had this little, I tried to find, I don't know what I did, the little thing that said in Russian, English, and in Hungarian, to help this person to get back to his hometown. Well. I arrived in my hometown. Uh, at those days, there are still some Jews who went back, and they used to come to the train. Every time a train came from the west, hoping that somebody may come home. Well, I got off the train. There was nobody waiting for me. But I knew where this Dayak family that uh, was working for us lived. So by f on foot, I went, and I walked up to this woman who was in her yard, and I said, uh, you know who I am? No, I don't. So I told him, when. well, again, big screaming, big happiness and all that. A few Jews returned, a lawyer who was a friend of my father, he was there, so I moved in with him. My house, only the wall stood. It was completely gutted from the inside. They took apart every nook and cranny looking for treasures, hope, thinking that we were burying it in the, in the walls or in the, in the chimneys or whatever. There was nothing left. The doors were taken off. It was just an empty shell. This banker, Shufrich, who my father entrusted with the jewelry, asked me to come to dinner to his house. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know a thing about it. My father wouldn't tell me because he was afraid I would spill the beans and then uh, there would be all kinds of problems. So he sort of uh, found out that I really don't know anything about what was going on and what he has. So he said, "My father, your father gave me this to safe keep this, this jewelry. It was a gold watch and a few little things, nothing, not the diamonds that my mother had. That he kept this, and he never returned those to me. And after about four weeks there, uh, my friend of my father's, this lawyer, says, well, we have to make a decision. Either you're going to stay here and continue with your schooling, or you're going to set up a home here, or you're going to go f f try to find your dad. I don't recall anymore how I found out that not too far across the 
Ukrainian border, now it was part of Ukraine, it became the Ukraine, this Zakarpatska Ukraine, they call it. One of my aunts, who was in Budapest, survived with her, sis, with, her, with her daughter, and an uncle of mine, not a brother, but the brother-in-law of my mother, the sister of my mother, Ethel, her, his wife died and the children died, but he returned. So he and this other sister of my mother's lived together with the daughter of this, of this, of this woman, Aranka, Golda. And somehow word got to me that they would like me to come to their place in Matisaka, which is Hungary. So I have to train from uh, Tacho or Techo, Techo, what they call it now, to Berehovo, Bereksas, which is right on the border of Hungary. And during the night, with this uh, uh, lawyer, we crossed the Hungarian border Ill illegally. You couldn't do that, but we snuck across the border. And I looked up my uncle and my aunt, and uh, of course, Great, great rejoicing. It was like, you know, finding uh, families, finding each other after a war. I mean, they may not be nuclear families. I mean, they nuclear families, but they were cousins, aunts, uncles, and so forth. So they asked me to stay with them till I'm able to f find exactly where my father is and how to get to him. I enrolled. Uh, he, he, he insisted that I go to uh, a uh, gymnasium, continue my studies. And for two others as it is, the dean of of the gymnasium in, in Maramaros, that I finished five years of gymnasium there, the fifth year there, became the dean of the gymnasium in that hometown. So I didn't have anything to prove that I really had five years, but he remembers me, and he gave a certificate, a affidavit that I was a student of his, and so on. So I was able to go to the sixth gymnasium. And I stayed in Matisaka for about a year, and then I heard from my father. He found out that I am with my aunt, and I found out where he is. We started corresponding with each other. But the trick was how to get from Hungary to the occupied Germany. There was the American zone of Germany in Munich. I tried it through Czechoslovakia. Uh, they caught me, they beat me up and sent me back. They wouldn't let me cross. Finally, the brother of this Izzo Shimshevich, who really saved my life in the camps, was in Budapest. And he was in touch with the organization that took Jews from Eastern Europe to Palestine. So I, they made me. Uh, he got me into this group of, of, of organized group that took the Jews from Hungary to Austria to Germany to Italy, and they usually wind up in on, on what was the island? Uh, uh, Cyprus? No, not Cy Cyprus. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they rarely got to Palestine. But I really, really didn't want to go to Palestine. I wanted to go to my father. So I knew they go through Germany. So I got them this group. They snuck us through the border. And I wound up back in Ebensee, in the camp that I was liberated from. They made a transition camp out of it now. And I was sitting there, and they said, well, when, when, I, when can I get on a transport to go to Germany? They said, oh, it takes a long time. I said, look, I have no time here. I want to do something. So I snuck on one of these cars, boxcars, that they took the Jews from there to Germany and to Italy. They hid me under some clothes because the count came. And when the train pulled out, I crawled out, and I was on my way to Germany. And we arrived in the middle of the night, and I got off in Munich. And I knew it was near Munich, Gauting, uh, the TB sanatorium. And I uh, hopped the commuter train from there. And I arrived in the sanatorium uh, middle of the night, about uh, 2 in the morning. There was a guard, a, a Jew, who wasn't a German, who said, who are you? I says, I am uh, Yuri Balasha. I am uh, Balasha Istvan's son, uh, my father's Stefan Balasha's son. He said, oh, he's a good friend of mine. He says, uh, let me take you to him. So he took me in the middle of the night and knocked on his window. And he says, what would you say if I bring you your son? You know, can you imagine? That was September of 1946. I haven't seen my dad from uh, May of 1944. So it's May. It's, it's over, two and a, over two years. Well, he was still sick. He was positive, uh, TB positive. Uh, but it was a, obviously a joyous reunion. But I couldn't stay in that sanatorium. So they made room for me in a, uh, through the UNRWA, the United Nations Restitution uh, Rehabilitation Organization, in a, in a children's center called Prinam Kimze, a gorgeous place in Bavaria, on a lake in the Strand Hotel. It is a resort hotel that they had, and they converted it into a place for young people like me, uh, under 16, under 17, boys, girls together. And it was just, just a great time. I made friends there that I still correspond with. Uh, one is in San Francisco, some are in California, some are in Detroit. And funny thing is, 
almost everyone who is still alive did well. I mean, these kids came from there with nothing. I mean, nothing, less than nothing. We came here with nothing except the will to, to make it. When I see all these people coming, and I, I, I mean, God bless the Russian Jews, let them come, but all the help they're getting and they're bitching and moaning, they haven't got good enough, I says, you know something? I don't feel sorry for them. I'm sorry. We had to do it. We had to earn it, like they say, and we did. Most of them did very well. Some of them died. But anyway, in pre Nam Kimze, we had a good time for a while, but then they said, look, you cannot just frolic around. Uh, I said, I want to go to America. I had cousins here that left Hungary in 1938. You have to do something, learn something. You have to do something with your life. And that's how Ort got into my life. This a school opened in this, uh, there, but they had nothing that I really wanted to do. I mean, the close, uh, first I chose to become a blacksmith. Now, what's the future of a blacksmith? But I felt that's interesting to heat the iron and doing some soldering and this and that. After that, I became an electrician. And when I became old enough, uh, older, in age 17, they couldn't stay in Priam Kimsey. They moved us to Rosenheim, another DP camp that was run by the, now the, the UNRWA ceased to exist, now it's the IRO, the International Refugee Organization. Uh, there was a bigger uh, old school, and my father was a pharmacist, my uncle a physician, my grandfather a physician. I figured I want to do something that has to do with the human body. I want to be in the, that vein. They had a school where they trained dental mechanics, dental technicians. So I said, well, at least as close as I can get to the human body, I will become a dental technician at least. So I started my training as a dental technician in the old school in Rosenheim, 1947-48. My father, in the meantime, uh, got better, well, and he became the chief pharmacist of that sanatorium. So he had a good job and a good position. He, he, he adjusted quite well. In the meantime, uh, it took a long time to, to get to America. If, I ha uh, if Truman hadn't passed the uh, DP quota, I would probably still sitting in, in, in Germany. Uh, but I had to go through some formalities. Then after the, the quota was passed, I had to be interviewed that I am not a Nazi, that I am not a communist, and you know, the whole bit. Finally, in September of 1949, from Munich, I graduated, by the way, from the old school. I have the diploma here, which I show you. Uh, they shipped me to uh, Bremerhaven, and I boarded a ship, USS Sturgis, an American troop carrier ship, to come to America. It was about 1955. I should be uh, jumping ahead of myself. My father was in Germany, of course, and I left him there in 1949. He was very sick. He, he couldn't come to America because he was still TB positive. While I was in the Air Force in 1951, he finally was able to come, and so we rejoined each other here, and we lived together in, 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 in first he was in Baltimore for a while, that's where his affidavits sent him, and uh, through his affidavits, the highest sent him there. And then he was able to come to Chicago, and we set up household together here on the south side of Chicago while I was going to dental school. And he was a very unhappy person because he wasn't a pharmacist. He, did, he was too old at that time. He didn't speak the language too well, and he, he just wasn't about to take the exams to become a pharmacist. But for two others as it was, he met a German pharmacist here who introduced him to a Mr. Lev, who is now a patient of mine, who was the head of the pharmacy at Michael Reese Hospital. And uh, my father went there, and, my, and Mr. Lev hired him as a pharmacist, although it was a little bit illegal. He didn't have a diploma, but he was a good pharmacist. And in those days, there were still physicians who prescribed according, you know, take this and take that and mix it and make a powder out of it or a, a suppository. My father was able to do that. Very few American uh, pharmacists were trained to that. So, and they, he was a workaholic and they just loved him and he was very good to them and they were good to him. And then he regained his self-esteem as a pharmacist. This is my uh, tattoo. The number is B10511-10511. The serial B means that the, the numbers without any letters, and the A numbers were all gone, and this was the B serial number of Auschwitz-Birkenau.